Okay, we are now recording. I want to welcome you all to what is the finale of eCampus Ontario's Open Education Week webinar series. We have heard this week from faculty, from students, from instructional designers, from librarians, from members of our Francophone community about what open education means to them and how they are living it in their day-to-day -day practice um, as educators and as people. So now we want to turn um, towards the leadership side of our institutions. And eCampus Ontario is so pleased to welcome um, two incredible leaders to help us consider these two questions. We wanna, we wanna dig into these two issues on this webinar today. We wanna consider open education from a leadership perspective. What does it mean to be a leader in higher education when you are trying to implement an open education strategy? And what does that institutional strategy look like? So I wanna welcome um, these two women um, leaders to our panel. Carol Shepstone is the Chief Librarian at Ryerson University, um, and Ryerson has been um, on the leading edge of a lot of work um, in open education in Ontario. And I also want to welcome Lori Rancor, Senior Vice President Academic at Humber College. Lori has been involved in the eCampus Ontario initiative and from the very early days and has been a tireless advocate for the work that we're doing. And Humber College has recently um, taken huge strides in the space of open education. So they both have a lot to share. Um, I am your moderator. My name is Lena, and I'm going to be um, just facilitating this session. We are going to hear first from Carol, and then we are going to hear from Lori. They are each going to be going through their presentations. They're not going to be any longer than 10 minutes. Um, they do have some slides to share. And after that, we ask that you bring forward your questions. I have a couple of my own that can help seed the discussion, but we are really interested in hearing from you um, and your, your reactions and your thoughts to what you hear um, these two um, leaders sharing with you today. So without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Carol to start us off. Oh, I'm sorry. We're starting with Lori. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lori. I got the order wrong. Oh, that's, Go ahead. That's quite all right. Thanks very much, Lena. Um, so, and, and thank you for, uh, for the, the kind introduction and, and for this opportunity to, uh, to join in this, in this, what I hope will end up being a, a really interesting dialogue. Um, and, you know, when, when uh, we were approached to, to participate in this webinar, uh, there were, you know, three questions that, um, that, that Lena asked of us, that asked us to think about. Um, because when being a leader at, at this, at, particular time, you know, when there is such opportunity uh, out there to leverage uh, technology and to leverage uh, so many new approaches to uh, the practice of teaching and learning, um, you know, one of the challenges that we have is that the, the world really is our oyster and there are so many directions that we can um, you know, throw ourselves in as as we're approaching these um, these 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 opportunities, and so yeah, you'll see that the, based on the slide that's in front of you that you know the way I come at this is uh, thinking about open education um, as really a promise. You know, open education provides us with some potential. There there is a promise there. Uh, but that we need to have strategy if we're going to capitalize on that promise. Um, and so, the, you know, one of the first questions that Lena asked is, is what is it about open education that res resonates with me as a leader? Um, and, and Lena, if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, can I do that? No, I don't think so. Oh. All right. So, so when I think about, you know, what, what, what is it about open education that resonates with me? It is just that. It's the promise that it brings um, for us to be able to uh, do things that we have wanted to do in higher education, uh, you know, for, for 
since, since the beginning. One of those uh, uh, potential, one of the potential promises of open education is the ability to increase access to uh, to knowledge, to learning, to resources. So with open educational resources, we have the potential to have any time, anywhere access. Um, we have the potential to remove the cost barrier to accessing resources for our students and for really for for um, the academics and, and the teachers that are involved in, in the teaching and learning space. Uh, we have an increased opportunity to openly share knowledge um, with each other and, and with our students. By increasing access uh, and removing, uh, to some extent, that cost barrier, there's the promise of really opening up the, the potential for, for student success. One of the things that our students struggle with, um, you know, in, in my practice, I've seen students many students don't purchase the te course textbook uh, because of the, the it's just cost prohibitive for them if we think about starting to embed open educational resources into the teaching and learning environment we have just removed that financial concern and and really made it possible for for students to uh, engage with materials and and take charge of, of their learning and that in turn uh, you know helps um, increases the potential for for their success uh, you know another promise of open educational resources is the uh, the increased ability to have um, just in time relevant. Uh, when you're relying on published works uh, that need to be purchased, there's 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 a lot of um, you know you have to wait for the next edition sometimes if you want to bring the most recent adaptations to to your students. Um, and so with the open educational resource, really, uh, you know, you can you can go in and modify and update as you need to based on what's happening um, within the discipline. When you've got communities of practice that are engaged uh, in jointly creating open educational resources, you can work together and, um, and, and, and apply continuous improvement. If you get if you're getting feedback um, and learning things from your students and from each other, you can apply that um, immediately to the resources that you're using in the teaching and learning environment. Uh, there's, there's the promise of uh, more, um, more collaboration and increased opportunities for collaboration. As you are uh, engaging in the open resource, uh, in the open education environment, um, you now have the opportunity to jointly create um, and to go in and modify and that can happen in real time it can happen in a synchronous way and it can also happen in in an asynchronous way and I think finally from the perspective of promise for me uh, you know the engagement with open edu open education allows for more interdisciplinarity where you know as opposed to having one author providing input into an open education resource you can have um, authors contributors from different backgrounds engaging with the materials and updating them and um, integrating into them different different worldviews and different different um, different components that, that can be related that, you know, and then if you, you know, the second question that was asked um, of us was, so then when you consider open education resources, uh, what are the, 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 the factors to consider at the organizational level? And for me, the biggest thing um, that, that, that becomes important is making sure that you actually have an organizational level strategy. Uh, if we're gonna capitalize on the promise that is, is made available to us through the open education world, uh, we have to make sure that we're being systematic about it, that we're being intentional about it. Uh, one of the things that I've seen um, is that there, there has been a lot of early adoption of open educational resources, which is, which is wonderful and amazing, uh, but also 
if you don't have a, a strategic approach to it, a cohesive approach to it, those, uh, those initiatives can remain ad hoc or they can uh, remain uh, limited or focused in you know just specific program areas or um, you know we have a wonderful center for teaching and learning here at Humber and a, and a team that works with uh, professors on on developing really amazing approaches to teaching and learning using these types of tools and resources but you know quite often what happens is there's there's a group of, of people that are well ahead and but you always tend to see the same people uh, engaging in these kinds of activities and so it, it, it can become something that um, isn't uh, generalized and isn't really being taken advantage by everyone so if you think about all of the elements of promise that I talked about um, earlier, if you look at increased access, uh, that is true if you have really considered open educational resources uh, from, from you know, all four sides of the house, if, if you want to like, use that analogy. If you're creating open educational resources and using um, technology to do so, uh, your students won't have more, you may have taken the, the financial barrier away, but if there is a requirement for them to have easy internet access or, um, you know, high speed internet, uh, you're not increasing access if you haven't made sure that all of your students are in a position to be able to access the types of resources that you're creating. The same concept applies to the need to, to consider universal design for learning, to consider the requirements of AODA compliance, to consider language and culture, um, and all of those other components that uh, can inadvertently lead to non-access if you haven't paid attention to it. From the perspective of student success, um, you know, again, if you've removed the, the financial barrier, but you haven't provided students with, if they need additional training in how to access open educational resources, uh, it, is, it can't be a, um, a situation where it's if you build it, they will come. You have to make sure that you've really looked at your systems and processes and orientation processes to make sure that you, you, you've got a program of access, intentional access. The relevance uh, question. Um, what happens when you're looking at your business planning processes and, when, and, and in this context I'm talking about relevance to the organizational strategy. If uh, a very um, concrete example, if your organizational revenue uh, is dependent on your bookstore sales and now you're moving to open educational resources and you're not going to have that revenue generation, you need to have replaced that with some other strategy. Uh, is the, their ongoing relevance from a quality assurance um, perspective? Uh, have you made sure that you haven't just um, engaged faculty in the creation of open educational resources, but you've put in place some process to make sure that there is ongoing review and that there's, there's an intentionality to the updating of, of those resources? Um, and that they don't um, end up lagging from, from that perspective. Collaboration, uh, you know, you, you won't have in um, comprehensive collaboration if you haven't put in place the professional development opportunities so that your teaching and learning um, teams understand what how open education works uh, that there are uh, while the copyright issues uh, in some ways are eliminated there are there are still copyright rules uh, open education doesn't mean free-for-all um, there are regulations and there are uh, there are things that uh, guidelines and rules that, that need to be followed within the open educational realm and you also need to make sure that you're providing incentives to the individuals that are involved in the open education creation or use of those uh, to make sure that they're, they're, they're doing the continual update and, and maintenance. So, uh, you know, how do you ensure, and maybe we can go to the last slide, mindful of time, um, how do you ensure that you, as an organization, you are having uh, cross-divisional conversations that op open education is not just an academic division um, strategy. 
if, if you're going to have all of those, uh, you know, those processes and systems adapted to the use of open educational resources, and that it's part of the DNA of the organization, it has to be a priority for every department, um, not just for the teaching and learning team. And so if, from a Humber perspective, one of the ways in which we're, we're doing that is is in really having a dialogue and, and uh, a an open educational strategy that we are anchoring in our broad organizational strategic priorities. So you have to make sure that the language of your strategic plan and your business plans really align and you can demonstrate that alignment to open education. So very, very quickly, if you look at Humber's strategic plan, there are three pillars to that plan. And there is language, you know, it's opportunities for all students, unique learning experiences. Uh, we have a priority of enabling student choice, mobility, and access. We're talking about empowering students by transforming the learning environment and offering more choice in how, what, when, and where they learn and looking at providing leadership in developing sustainable campuses. And so tying your open education strategy um, to each of those pillars becomes important. And in doing so, it becomes a, prime, um, you know, a priority and an imperative for everybody within the organization. And with that, I'll turn it over maybe to Carol. Thank you so much, Lori. That was wonderful. Okay, Carol, you're up next. Carol, are you with us? Sorry, there I am. Oh, good. Oh, good. Sorry, I was I was talking away. So no I problem. For that. So thank you very much for the invitation to join today, and uh, congratulations on all the OE Week events everyone's held, and happy International Women's Day as well. Um, uh, thank you uh, to Lori for for your great overview and sharing what's happening at Humber. Um, Certainly, I think from my perspective, um, OE uh, has the potential to radically transform higher education and it's really important for every one of our institutions to think of ways to engage and, and to respond uh, to that potential and, and to, as Laurie said, that promise. So what I want to share with you today are some thoughts about um, uh, linking strategy uh, and priorities around open education looking at some of the ways the opportunistic um, uh, events may be able to be leveraged and even thinking about challenges and how those can be uh, perhaps considered opportunities in advancing the conversation around open education. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the role of the academic library uh, in these conversations and in this space. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So um, at Ryerson University, to give you a little bit of context uh, about where we sit, uh, these are our uh, four strategic priorities uh, and uh, our foundational principles are there in the middle. And as you can see, um, these have great potential as probably most or all of our institutional priorities do have to uh, advance the open education and the open education resource conversation. So um, I would add that Ryerson is a highly decentralized institution, which I think um, adds some particular challenges to how uh, you develop a strategy when there is such a, a significant amount of autonomy uh, and uh, decentralized authority around how to move forward. That being said, if you want to think about student engagement and success, Ryerson has a particular emphasis on experiential learning. So I've kind of pulled out a few thoughts around each of these priorities and I think that's a great potential to consider uh, open education and, and the opportunities around the intensity and advancing uh, scholarship research and creative activity which is our SRC priority there. I think Ryerson uh, coming from a polytechnic background uh, to university status really focuses on applied and real world uh, research and scholarship and again I think some particular opportunities to be leveraged uh, around open education. 
uh, a strong focus, as many know, on uh, an innovative ecosystem. We've got um, interesting entrepreneurial startups. We've got zone learning and a real sense of change making on this campus, which is helpful. And of course, a strong focus on city building and um, being integral to the community of downtown uh, Toronto, but also focus on social justice and what, what does that look like on campus. So I think these priorities, as well as the foundational principles around EDI and our particular commitment um, as an institution to the TRC calls to action, all of these create um, such opportunity to consider how to leverage and how to develop a strategy around open education. I, I would also add we're in the process of refreshing, refreshing our uh, academic and research plans and so um, no time like the present to make sure that we get some good um, strong language in some of these documents. If you can move to the next slide. Thanks. So um, when we think about each of these points, and again, some of these um, have also been mentioned by Laurie, and, and um, I, I, I think of these in this larger context, and certainly academic success and access issues are um, incredibly um, uh, there's so much to be gained uh, if we're looking at open education in, in this realm. But I would add as well that I think uh, the notion, if building on the notion of experiential learning, the notion of uh, students being actually engaged in content creation, in critical information um, uh, considerations, um, really unpacking and thinking about their role as consumers of information and as creators of information, I think are really interesting, as well as building on um, uh, higher retention uh, around material that they may be working with and learning in different ways. So I think the potential not only of access for student ac academic success, but also being able to actually co-create uh, and engage with material um, is so critically important. Certainly, as I mentioned, social justice uh, has some great applications, and I think open education uh, and OER are really closely tied uh, with social justice. It's about whose voice is being privileged, how can we change uh, the content and the diversity of ideas and voices, uh, and, and how can we uh, think critically about how open education and social justice interact. And this certainly connects in with city building, as I said, but you see it in content creation. So lots of uh, institutions, certainly libraries, are, are doing um, wikiathons, um, building new kinds of content that is community-based, uh, working with various um, perhaps um, equity-seeking groups that are looking to add voice and, and uh, content. And last year, we actually linked um, a, a panel session during Social Justice Week uh, that was all about- White House Communications Director Bill Shine has resigned. I'm gonna go Sorry. straight over to the White House, right? Uh, straight over to White House Correspondent CNN, Caitlin Collins, for more on this. Caitlin, what Sorry. are you hearing? Yeah, Kate. Is anybody else hearing that? <laughs> Okay, are we good now? Okay, good. Go I was checking my phone there, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, in addition, I would uh, mention uh, um, equity, diversity, and community inclusion and thinking about open pedagogies there uh, as well. And as a strong um, value foundation at this institution, it's, it's really, um, I think, important to think about different ways learners learn, different types of access, as Laurie said, but also how can we customize that? How can we uh, assist uh, using open education, open pedagogy, open education resources in, in ensuring um, access? Pedagogical innovation, of course, it's not uh, necessarily inherent at open education, but I think it creates that space where there are so many possibilities to create new products, to think uh, for teaching and learning and to think differently about how we uh, conceive of teaching uh, and how we understand that role. And even notions of um, academic freedom, which I think are often cited in many campuses as being a barrier uh, to some of the work around open access or, or open education and open education resources. Really, I think if we frame that conversation in a different way and we uh, consider the challenges that might exist currently in collective agreements as, as real opportunities to work with faculty to think differently about 
the ability that open education can give you as a faculty member to choose how to teach, what to teach, and when to teach. So we're not uh, perhaps um, limited by what the textbook publishers have packaged for us uh, or um, uh, perhaps conveniently provided through slides and assessments, et cetera, but really think about uh, putting back education in the hands of, of faculty members in, in many ways. Um, and then, of course, partnerships, uh, all of those connectors with our partners on campus, uh, the Learning and Teaching Office, the e-learning office, uh, partnerships that we may have uh, outside of the institution with faculty members, um, et cetera. And, um, thinking too about how do we leverage the entire spectrum, the ecosystem of open access, open education resources, open science, open publishing, how can we leverage all of those notions that are part of this conversation to uh, advance open education overall. So I think you might end up with a faculty member or, or uh, an administrative colleague or a student who might be familiar with one area or concerned about one um, point in the spectrum in this ecosystem, but there's opportunity to leverage and think uh, more broadly about uh, the whole. So you can go to the final slide. Um, so here I just wanted to put uh, a little bit of a lens uh, of where I think academic libraries, kind of in the heart of this, have some opportunities and particular leadership roles. So, um, you know, I see academic libraries really at that intersection of teaching and learning, of students and faculty, of scholarship and research, of knowledge creation and knowledge sharing. So we touch so many parts of uh, the academic organization and, and those that are working within it. I think there's great opportunity and, and we've seen a lot of libraries step up and, and work to leverage this. So certainly education and awareness, we work with faculty, we have those existing relationships, we know what faculty are teaching. We, we've, uh, we deal with students who are coming to us, we co-teach, um, there's all sorts of connectors. At Ryerson, like many institutions, uh, the library is offering grants for OER development. We're working with our uh, partners in the Teaching and Learning Office and in um, the e-learning office, and I think that that's uh, really fantastic to think about ways to engage in teaching and learning with students. We know students are the best advocates for um, OER and uh, many times open education. And I think we see those students, we know what they're uh, attempting to learn, we know the struggles that they have, um, and uh, we can give them voice. We, we had our uh, regular uh, student library um, consultation session town hall this week, and we talked about open education resources, as many institutions participating in the textbook broke, uh, looking at ways to make sure that courses are listed in calendars with course credits or another opportunity. Mm. And we, we know that e-reserves, uh, because that's something that's working out of our, our offices, are, are um, another great leveraging point. And of course, uh, publishing and copyright, those are areas that we have expertise in. We understand the publishing world, we understand the nature of textbook publishing and scholarly publishing, and we are involved in open journal systems, open monograph systems, uh, repositories, uh, policy work around that. So I think there's some wonderful education work to be done to link in um, copyright and intellectual property uh, and to raise that awareness uh, and, and look at advancing there. And finally, I would just add uh, libraries, uh, role in infrastructure and you mentioned off the top Lena uh, Ryerson's been involved with eCampus um, Ontario and helping with the infrastructure development which has been fantastic for us and uh, I think that our longevity our role in providing that consistency of uh, academic support uh, and information to students and, and to the quality of programs is really is really key, as well as our consortial, our longstanding consortial relationships. So um, lots of opportunity to, to leverage and think about the role uh, of the library in, in this uh, particular venture on our campuses. So with that, I will stop and I look forward to questions and comments. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, there is a lot to dig into there, um, a lot to unpack. I will um, start by going um, and opening um, the line for questions. Um, if anyone would like to unmute themselves, 
Okay, there's a question in the chat here from Lindsay. She says, thank you both for sharing your insights. You both mentioned the importance of post-secondary institutions having a strong organizational strategy for OER. You also discussed some of the barriers to achieving this. I'm wondering if you might comment on what the most common department level barrier or challenge is that you have encountered so far. Well, I'll, it's Carol. Um, I'll maybe weigh in and say I'm I'm going to speak from a when you say department level in quotes. I'm assuming you not you don't mean within the library. I'm going to talk about working with perhaps um, departments, uh, other faculties on campus. And I think the biggest question uh, and challenge that I've experienced in various institutions, not just Ryerson, has been around that. Uh, it's been couched in terms of academic freedom, but I think it's it's probably if we peel back the layers a little bit, it's probably much more about workload and time uh, for faculty members and making sure that they have the right supports. Um, so so that's been interesting to have it framed one way, but if if you actually dig into it, I think. Um, the solutions lie with the appropriate supports, making sure that there's infrastructure there to move this forward as well as education. Um, it's yeah, uh, so uh, from my perspective, what I would say is that I haven't, it's not overt barriers that, that I've encountered. What I would say is it's more a lack of knowledge um, and a lack of understanding that um, that we do need support uh, from different departments as we're engaging in the open education um, strategy. So one of the things that we're trying to do at, at Humber, we, we're actually, we have a, a, cross, um, a cross divisional, cross department uh, steering committee now that's, that's working together on the open education strategy uh, because uh, there's a recognition that we, we need um, our student services departments, for example, to be aware of the strategy that we're engaging in and what it might mean for students um, uh, in the different types of supports that they may be looking for from tutors, for example, or uh, from, from other, other departments. We are, one of our strategies that we're working on is, is to target uh, you know, a certain number of programs per year that we would convert to textless programs. Uh, we've got uh, one now, uh, well, we've got more than one, but one that, that really has been a flagship and gone first, um, which is a clinical education research, um, might not be the exact title, uh, but graduate certificate. Uh, but the, the others in the organization are not aware that this is what we're striving for. And, and so I think it's, um, it, it's not barrier if, or, or resistance uh, per se. It is, it is really a lack of understanding. When, when people hear you say open education and they're not involved in it directly, they, they can develop several assumptions um, that, that result in unintended consequences uh, in, in moving the, the, the strategy forward. Thanks, Lori. That idea of having a cross-department steering committee working together for your larger OE strategy, that's a great idea. And I'm sure there are, might be many on this, on this call who will be thinking a little bit more about how they might do something similar at their institution. Yeah, and if I, you know, just a quick add to that, on that committee, we actually have representatives from the bookstore, right? And, and the, convers yeah. the conversation that we're having is, um, you know, that, that, that our goal is not to eliminate the bookstore. You still need that retail, and, and there will always be a requirement for different types of resources, but they really need to rethink what their in, in a world, if you envision a world where um, we're not, we've got less and less required textbooks and we're using more and more open resources, then what is the role of the retail provider on campus? And so that's just one example where uh, you wouldn't, we wouldn't have thought at the outset to include them on our working committee, but it's been important and it, and it has really pushed our thought process to think about the campus holistically. Wonderful. 
Okay, there's another question in the chat um, from Brandon. He says, great presentation and happy International Women's Day. Um, he says he's curious if you had any past experiences of changing a faculty member's views to seeing the benefits of open educational resources. Sure, it's Carol. Um, just building on that, I think that where I've seen some really great success, um, and it, you know, this isn't perhaps anything earth shattering, um, is really getting uh, faculty champions uh, on board and demonstrating in a real way um, faculty members um, who have had great success and seen uh, the impact and improvements in, in terms of learning outcomes and academic success of students. I think that that's really powerful. And I think there's something uh, really important about faculty to faculty conversations. Uh, we are just starting uh, an OER um, a group here on this campus, a consultation group, and we're really uh, focusing. It's a, it's a collaboration between the library and our learning and teaching office. And as we're thinking about constructing this this uh, uh, committee on our campus, we're really looking at bringing faculty members on board and having it really focused on on that kind of conversation. Again, that really reflects our, our decentralized nature, nature. So I think that's going to be really exciting. The other thing that I have seen as really, really impactful is uh, hearing the stories of students. I think in some ways, um, uh, you know, it's that uh, um, principal agent conversation. Faculty members may not realize, especially with OER, how expensive some of the, the course material is that they're pur purchasing or requiring their students to purchase. And when you start to hear the bigger, bigger issues that students are struggling with, uh, I think that can really help faculty members start to think differently about what they can do. They want their students to succeed. Nobody, nobody wants someone to be unnecessarily struggling. So how can this um, make uh, students learn more and be more successful and how can this improve my teaching those are really compelling conversations for faculty yeah and um, so I, I would definitely agree with Carol that where you know I I actually personally have not had an experience of convincing you know changing somebody's mind or convincing them about the value of open educational resources and and that you know, and the pedagogical quality and the rigor that, that, you know, you still have all of that in place with open educational resources. It's really the peer to peer. It's the, it's getting professors uh, working with each other and, and sharing their successes. And so our, uh, you know, I mentioned our, our center for teaching and learning and, and the wonderful people that work there and, and those early adopters um, that we're working to engage in uh, providing them with the space and and the resources to present and to and to work with their peers uh, and and it's through those uh, it's through that peer-to-peer -peer interaction and the creation of communities of practice that you start to see the the adoption happening um, and it's through seeing those those successes and, and working together So um, I have a question for you both. Um, I'm wondering what advice you might give um, to either other leaders uh, if they do not already have an orientation towards open educational resources in their institutional strategy, um, or if or to um, other other people at different levels within an institution who might also be looking around within their institution and saying and feeling like there's no support. Um, at, at any level for something of this nature. How might you, what is the, what is the place to start from your perspective? Well, I, I'm, I mean, as an eCampus Ontario board member, <laughs> I would, I would really say that, that we are so fortunate to have eCampus Ontario and the work that Ryerson is doing around, um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure Carol will speak to this, but um, it's to look outside if it isn't available within your your organization or your institution there are uh, there are places like eCampus Ontario like BC campus like uh, you know there, there are provincial there are national um, places where 
those communities have practiced the resources. You know, it, it isn't even, um, there are so many resources that people can start to access and use and, mm -hmm. and begin to see the value. So I think it's to look, it's to look outside your organization, but just, just you know, within our system, we have uh, lots of resources. Within your, within your, your, your institutions, I'm going to echo what Carol said, our library, you know, our, our Center for Teaching and Learning is, is amazing. Our library is, is, is a wonderful place for people to start. And librarians know about this stuff. And, um, and I, you know, I, I would be hard pressed to, uh, to, to find, a, you know, a librarian that I've ever interacted with that, that isn't excited about this kind of thing. Um, so that, those would be my, my two off the top recommendations. Thank you. Thanks. Carol, yeah. Um, well, thanks for that plug for libraries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with anything you said there. Um, I guess I think that um, a couple of things were coming to mind as you were talking, Laurie, for me. And, and one of them is that it's, it's completely um, okay and actually probably really practical to, to start small. So uh, I think there are, you know, eCampus is there. I think there are other communities of practice. Yes, ev every uh, library will, will um, certainly know, if not have the capacity to assist. But I think, I think it's okay to start small and to find um, those areas where there's a desire uh, for innovation and some real interest to do things differently. And we know that exists on, on every campus in, in different locations, and that's fine. I think the other thing is I kind of look at it as a, um, a kind of approach that is working at multiple levels at the same time. So it can't all be from the bottom up. That's important. And it can't all be from the top down. You need to be coming at this in, in multiple approaches and always looking for opportunities to say, here's a place where open education matters and makes a difference. Here's a way that we can connect this to the work that you're doing or the work you want to do or a new project or a new initiative. So, you know, linking it back into that larger ecosystem of what is open right now, there's huge traction on um, open access and the challenges with e-resource costs and, you know, vendor uh, um, uh, revenues and things. And so to me, that's that's just another segue to have a conversation about open education, open education resources, all of that. So always kind of looking for those opportunities to um, plant that seed or situate that conversation, um, I find uh, really valuable, actually. And I would, you know, I would add to that, uh, Carol, I agree with everything you've said. And I think, you know, back to our opening presentations where you know, we were talking about the need to tie this to strategy mm. and to tie it to other goals and objectives yeah. that you're working on. If, if, if open education becomes a project for a project's sake, right? If it, if it is something that you're working on, but that, that you see as an end in and of itself, you're probably going to have, it's, it's going to be more of a struggle. Um, it really has to become something that uh, is is a means to to achieve your strategic objectives your other objectives how do you tie it to your priorities and and um, start to to get that recognition that it's actually it, it, it's a, it's a solution <laughs> uh, you know you have to innovate with purpose innovation for innovation's sake tends to to peter itself out fairly quickly that was gold Innovate with purpose, tie it to other goals and activities you're working on as a means to achieve your strategic objectives. Thank you both. Um, there's a question in the chat from Corey. He says, hi, I work at a large university with a mostly remote and adjunct faculty model. A struggle I face is spreading the word and communicating with these faculty who are often changing term over term to build them aboard the OER mothership. Do you have any sort of mass communication strategies you can share with us in order to more effectively engage a large and maybe um, remote population? It's Carol here. I, I don't know about mass communication strategies, but I wonder about, for those particular groups, adjuncts, 
uh, and perhaps remote, but uh, I'm thinking some of the challenges of time uh, are really exacerbated, right? So if we know that full-time faculty, tenured track faculty or tenured faculty sometimes struggle with workload and time and, and there's the, you know, the notion of how much is invested to create an OER or even adopt an OER if, if we're talking about um, that a specific aspect of open education. Um, and so I, I've kind of loved the approaches where um, people's time is really recognized. So when I was in Alberta, there was some attention to paying reviewers to look at open education uh, resource material and be a reviewer and there'd be a small uh, honorarium or a stipend for reviewers to engage in this process and what that did was really open people's eyes to what is already out there the quality the ability as a faculty member to actually use it and so there's a there's a sense of kind of practicality uh, to it and and also even if the stipend was small it was a recognition that your time is valuable and your expertise is valuable so that's that's just one thought that came to mind for me yeah and I, I would uh, you know I would um, I was thinking about my response and, and I think that what we haven't really taken um, a, a mass communication approach to this um, you know, we, we've really uh, tried to do this, although we have the organizational level strategy where we're, we're, we're really trying to, 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 to um, make sure that it is, it is something that is top of mind for uh, all, all of our departments. Uh, you know, Carol said something earlier about needing to make sure that you're coming at this from different directions, right? It can't all be top down and it can't all be bottom up. Yeah. Um, and so we are trying to incentivize and and create space in, in a program team kind of format. And so um, we aren't using mass communication. We're actually uh, working through the various um you know, the library is probably the biggest mass communication. Uh, our librarian and, and our library team are, are, are have the most touch points with individuals. And so they're committed and they're convinced and, and they're talking to everybody about it, as is our, our Center for Teaching and Learning. But at the organization level, we're really doing this on a team by team basis and, and carving out the time and, and the space to do it. It's taking longer. I wouldn't say that we're where we want to be um, or that we even have, I mean, we're very large. I, I wouldn't say that we have broad-based um, knowledge or understanding yet but we're working on it and we're doing it um, on a team by team basis. And you do need, um, you need something to point to sometimes, right? Um, some yeah. successes internally in order to bring more people, more people aboard. I think that there's, you know, there's, we, Carol made the great point about proceeding in an ad hoc fashion. Um, or maybe that was you, Lori, you both made that point about how important it is to kind of, um, have some sort of centralized approach, but also you just need to work with who's willing to work with you as well, right? And keep the communication channels active. So I, I am going to wrap up now because um, we are almost at time. Um, I want to thank both of our panelists for um, sharing their insights, um, giving us their time, and, and being so thoughtful about, um, about considering these kinds of questions from a leadership lens. I think it's a perspective that we don't, um, we don't hear from often enough. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of the other panelists that were part of Open Education Week um, webinars through eCampus Ontario. Um, they were all fantastic. Please stay um, in touch. Um, a lot of them were recorded. You can go back and watch them if you're interested in the student one. There were some great, um, great um, contributions from faculty from colleges and universities across Ontario, librarians. So um, make sure to follow up um, with eCampus Ontario for more information on that. I also want to thank AI Media for the captioning today. And I want to say that 
the captioning that you're seeing at the bottom of my screen is, um, is automatic from Google Docs and is not the great work that they were doing um, throughout this webinar. So um, thank you again to AI Media for captioning and making this webinar accessible. And to all of you for joining in today, happy International Women's Day, happy Open Education Week, and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much. I'm going to now stop the recording. Thanks everyone.